morning. My name is Leah Matthew and welcome to the seminar and lecture series of the School of Arts and Sciences, Ahmedabad University. The seminar and lecture series is an integral part of how we imagine interdisciplinary learning at Ahmedabad University. The series invites distinguished scholars from across the world and from across different disciplines. And we hope for these conversations to create a platform through which the larger university community can engage with important debates. The pandemic has given us an opportunity to transcend geographic distances and time zones. It has also raised urgent and important questions about the problems we face as a society. Today's panel of distinguished speakers will address the question of social policy in the midst of a pandemic. Our speakers for today are Amit Basule, Sai Balakrishnan and Arindam Dutta. Amit Basule is an Associate Professor of Economics at the School of Liberal Studies, Azim Premji University, Bangalore where he also heads the Center for Sustainable Employment. Until 2016, he was an assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. He has a PhD in economics from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and a prior PhD in neurobiology from Duke University. Most of Amit's recent work is in the areas of poverty and inequality, informality, employment, structural change, and political economy of knowledge. His work is primarily on the Indian economy. Sai Balakrishnan is an assistant professor of city and regional planning at the University of California, Berkeley. Her research and teaching broadly pivot around global urban inequalities with a particular focus on urbanization and planning institutions in the global south and on the, so on the spatial politics of land use and property. She's worked as an urban planner in the United States, India and the UAE and as a consultant to the UN Habitat, Nairobi. Balakrishnan's recent book, Shareholder Cities, Land Transformations Along Urban Corridors in India, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press in 2019, explores new spatial forms of urbanization by focusing on land contestations along infrastructural economic corridors in liberalizing India. Finally, Professor Arindam Datta is Professor of Architectural History and Director of the MIT Infrastructure Architecture Lab set up to conduct research and to propose strategies regarding the relationships between broad macroeconomic factors driving built infrastructure and the specificities of architectural and urban form. His teaching interests are in the area of modern architectural theory and history, imperialism, globalization, and third world politics, technology studies and body politics, Marxist and post-structuralist thought. Professor Datta obtained his PhD in the history of architecture from Princeton University in 2001. He has degrees in architectural design from the Harvard Design School and the School of Architecture in Ahmedabad, India. Patrick, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, um, Leah. So I'd just like to really reinforce the, the welcome to our, our three visiting speakers. And I want to say really to, to all of you, to, to, to Amit uh, Basile from Azim Premji, from uh, 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 Sai Balakrishnan um, from University of California, Berkeley, and Arindam Datta at MIT, that we are particularly appreciative because I, I know that during the, the pandemic, we seem to get extra invitations to do, to do work. It's like, just join this event. Uh, it'll only take up an hour and a half. And if you had to get on an airplane, you'd say, well, maybe not. But somehow you join and your day gets extended and you think, how do I fit 26 hours in the day? And then you suddenly realize that somebody's in a different time zone and you're going to have to get up at 5 a.m. And we're all doing it somehow. And I, I hope we don't have to do it for too much longer and that we'll meet you all um, in person. But just to say briefly about Ahmedabad University that uh, we are only 11 years old, and the School of Arts and Sciences is only three years old, and yet already we have um, about 45 full-time professors in everything from life sciences and mathematical and physical sciences to humanities, languages, social sciences, and performing and visual arts, uh, who have joined us from universities or, or from, from doing PhDs in universities from all over the world. And some of the colleagues who are on this uh, seminar or webinar today, uh, who I'm seeing, who are in everything from, from economics to uh, business to history to philosophy, will I think be asking them 
quite challenging uh, questions in the way that early career professors who've been well trained tend to. So get ready for when your presentations uh, come to an end and the, uh, the questions kick in. Um, so we, uh, as Kartik alluded to, we, we have um, students coming into School of Arts and Sciences. We have a couple of hundred now, but we also have an existing management school and engineering school, uh, which takes the number of students in Ahmedabad University into the thousands. And in a sense, we are older in that we are backed by the Ahmedabad Education Society, uh, who provide the, the land and the infrastructure and the initial funding for the university. The Ahmedabad Education Society was set up in the 1930s um, by people like um, Sada Patel, Mavlanka, uh, the first speaker of the of Lok Sabha, people who were thinking at that time uh, you know, we need plans for education for when freedom comes, whether it's dominion status or full independence, we, we, we're going to need a new education system. And so a lot of the educational initiatives that have taken off in Ahmedabad over the last 50, 60, 70 years, uh, anything from IAMs to IITs to SEPT to NID actually originate with that vision of a new sort of opportunity for education and the founding of Ahmedabad University with its three schools and its four centers, including areas like Center for Heritage Management uh, and a center around climate change, which is itself an offshoot of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. A, a, a lot of the, the sort of the roots and the thinking uh, really go back quite a long way. And all of the um, faculty that we recruit are expected to teach and to do research. Uh, so it's really quite ambitious in terms of what sort of university we're hoping to uh, become at a time when, as you know, higher education is facing all sorts of really quite varied challenges uh, of different kinds um, in India. And so far it is uh, going well within that, that kind of challenging um, circumstance. So uh, that was really what I, what I wanted to say by, by way of welcome. Um, the geography of social policy lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I think it's really uh, noticeable how quickly ideas uh, and some of those challenges are changing. Um, you, you just think you've got a hold on how policy in a particular country is addressing this. And then the facts on the ground change and you realize there's a, a recalibration going on. But one thing that I think is very striking at the moment at the end of October 2020 is the way that the United States and many European countries are having their uh, political systems very, very severely tested and challenged by the circumstance that they are in. And I have to say, personally, I'm fascinated by the way that the idea of negative liberty is being asserted by people in the countries that are most challenged by the, uh, the, the sheer number of people who are suffering from the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, this idea that I, I'm going to be free not to wear a mask, it's a very odd idea of freedom, uh, which itself just doesn't seem to be applicable in many countries, particularly in East Asia. Uh, doesn't really seem to be applicable in India. And I think these different conceptions of liberty and what liberty means, to what extent it's a social agreement or contract, and to what extent it's an individual supposed freedom, um, it, it is sort of really part of this uh, very large, wide social uh, debate in different countries. And I find it very intriguing sort of watching it out, watching it play out. Um, in real time. So um, I will now pass over to, uh, to Kartik, Professor Kartik Rao Kavale, who will um, coordinate the, the webinar from, from now on. And I think that after everybody speaks, he will begin with a round of questions and then move uh, to questions from the members of the audience who are here to, uh, today. So um, welcome and enjoy yourselves. Um, and I want to add my welcome to Ahmed, to Sai, and to Anil. Um, I'm uh, 
uh, though uh, Arindra was at MIT while I was a PhD student there, and I've actually never met him, but Amit and Sai are, are old friends. Um, it's, it's really nice to have this panel. Um, I um, wanted to um, do this panel discussion because um, it seems to me that, that the um, COVID-19 pandemic has really opened up uh, a lot of uh, questions about um, social policy, about at some level the very possibility of social policy, but also um, the, the absolute necessity for, for thinking more carefully about what, what it should be like. Um, and in, in so many ways, uh, questions that, that uh, and issues that have, that have plagued us for a long time uh, are uh, becoming so much more urgent today. Um, and, and so in a way, COVID-19 uh, has, has really shed light on uh, some very long-standing issues, uh, or at least that's what uh, I thought. And, and uh, what I knew is that uh, these are uh, people who've been writing about uh, what lessons we should learn from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, Sai and Arindam have been uh, uh, talking of uh, the spatial rift uh, that characterizes um, the uh, trajectories of uh, development, tra development trajectories of different regions in India. Uh, and I mean, it's a, it's a really powerful point that we've made, and we'll talk about that. Uh, Amit has, uh, I was one of the, I mean, Amit's center, the Center for Sustainable Employment, was one of the first uh, to come out with a bunch of surveys, or uh, the results of surveys about uh, how the working classes were faring. Um, this was back in May, I think. Um, and that was immensely helpful for all of us who were stuck at home and didn't really know, um, at least that's how I felt, um, that we didn't know what was going on and, and the scale of the crisis. Uh, I mean, we saw stuff on, in the news, but, but really, um, I wasn't really able to gauge the scale until I, I read some of these articles that Amit and others were writing at that time. And I thought it might be useful uh, for us to uh, look at some of these questions again now uh, that a few months have passed. Um, right? So anyway, oh, what I'll do now is that I'll uh, open with a bunch of uh, questions that I've put down. These are uh, indicative, but I just wanted to um, sort of read these out uh, because they'll give us a sense of the contours of the discussion. Uh, what what are the sort of issues that we want to uh, that we're going to be talking about today? Uh, and then uh, uh, the panelists can can sort of weigh in, um, and and then we'll we'll get to the question and answers. So um, I want to begin with uh, sort of which uh, segments of the population um, have, have really been affected the most uh, by the pandemic and the lockdown uh, that followed. Um, at the height of the lockdown in uh, March, April, and May, uh, migrants stranded, stranded in cities without the support of social networks were probably the most visible segment of the population that was affected by the imposition of the lockdown. Since then, uh, uh, large numbers of migrants have returned home. Some of them have then come back to their workplaces. Others have chosen to stay back. Uh, but there are also people who were not migrants, uh, who have not gone anywhere um, in all of these ones. Uh, the uh, Center for Monitoring Indian Economy, which is probably the, you know, the best source of information uh, these days because um, uh, the NSS is no longer quite working the way it used to. Uh, their uh, report in August stated that uh, job losses have in fact been more severe for um, salary workers, for typically urban. Uh, but uh, whereas um, sort of in, in rural areas and agriculture, things have probably not been so bad. So the first sort of question I want to ask is uh, what do we know now about how different segments of the working classes have fared in all of these fronts. Now, uh, the second uh, set of issues that, that I think we need to uh, discuss 
um, are the underlying uh, sort of um, the processes that, that gave rise to this crisis. Uh, Sai and Arindam in their recent work have showed that uh, the, the migrant crisis that we faced in May uh, need to be uh, seen from the perspective of uh, uh, the uneven trajectories of regional development in India. The migrants who suffered the most were those who had to traverse a spatial rift, this is their phrase, uh, that uh, separates the prosperous regions uh, of the country uh, along what they call a Western arc, uh, which goes all the way from Punjab in the north uh, to Tamil Nadu in the south, uh, tracing sort of the Western arc of the country. Um, so the spatial rift separates these regions from the backward regions in the east, in the center and the east, places like Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, um, Orissa, and so on. Um, they have traced the history of this uneven development to the Green Revolution, which sowed the uh, seeds of capital accumulation in some parts of India, but not others. So uh, I'd like, uh, it would be really helpful if Sai and Narendam can, can explain the importance of this history and uh, probably also comment on whether uh, the pandemic has exacerbated these uh, regional disparities, or is it possible that the pandemic has hit the more prosperous regional economies harder, thus forcing some sort of convergence in economic dependence? So that is uh, my question to um, Arindam and Sai. Finally, the question um, of uh, what, do we, what do we do about these patterns of uneven development? Uh, how can uh, knowing about them help us um, find social policy better? And I want to ask this question in, uh, along, uh, in three, uh, along three axes. The first is the urban-rural axis. Uh, are we facing a situation where people are choosing to stay back in the countryside because the welfare state is more accessible there than in urban areas? Um, Amit, um, not uh, during the pandemic, but much before that, uh, had, had mooted an urban employment guarantee program. Uh, this was last year. Um, so, um, I mean, the, the feeling that, that we don't have a good enough welfare state in urban areas is probably uh, something that, uh, so the, a lot of us have been feeling this from before. So uh, the question is, do we, uh, uh, are we facing the consequences of not investing in the urban welfare state adequately? That is one question. The second, uh, if many migrants are crossing state lines, then uh, is it possible for social policy to uh, offer uh, these migrants adequate protection in states uh, where uh, they do not have basic documentation uh, necessary to avail welfare benefits right now? For instance, a ration card. Uh, so uh, is ration card portability uh, the solution to our problems? Third, um, I mean, redesigning social policy along these lines requires uh, us to think fresh about fiscal and intergovernmental institutions. Um, given that state government budgets are really heavily stressed right now, where and how can we find the fiscal space for um, states to undertake social protection, um, social protection measures that are appropriate for the difficult times that we live in? Anyway, so these are the questions that I had, and uh, I'd now like to uh, pass the uh, floor to the panel. Uh, we could begin with Amit, I thought, and then go to Sai and Arun. Thanks, uh, Karthik. Uh, so I'll keep my remarks quite brief because I'm really looking forward to the discussion, particularly the longer historical perspective on regional imbalances, uh, you know, and uh, th their long shadow and so forth. So that would be good to get into. So let me so quickly get some broad facts out of the way, which I think most of us know, uh, but uh, you know, just to get us all on the same page. Um, <clears throat> first, uh, what is the empirical basis of the information that we have on what has happened since March? Uh, what we know is largely on the basis, of course, of newspaper reports and reportage of various kinds. Uh, uh, surveys that have been carried out by organizations such as ours or civil society organizations of various kinds, uh, which are all purposive surveys that target 
vulnerable populations and try to find out the effects of the crisis, uh, particularly the lockdown, but also there are now some follow-up surveys available as well to look at the nature of the recovery process. And these surveys typically look at three things, the effect on employment or livelihoods, um, the um, access, uh, the effect on households in terms of savings, uh, asset sales and so forth, hunger and so on. And three, uh, the access of government relief schemes uh, or measures. Uh, so we have uh, some information from various surveys. We are maintaining a database of these surveys for those who are doing this kind of work and would be interested. Our website has a spreadsheet that uh, archives these surveys as they, as they become available. And we have 35 as of last count uh, from a variety of sources. Uh, so I'm emphasizing this because uh, apart from CMIE, there is no nationally representative data uh, to tell us what has happened. Um, these are the surveys, which are the main source of information. As for CMI, uh, which Karthik mentioned, uh, there are some caveats to interpret the data. I can get into that later if people are interested in it. Uh, but that remains the only uh, national data set that we have to look at the impact, particularly on employment uh, and incomes. Uh, it doesn't really get into government schemes and, and so forth. Uh, so that's the empirical basis. Now, what has happened broadly, uh, I think everybody knows uh, that the impact of the lockdown, of course, was felt immediately and most severely by the migrants uh, because they were at the intersection of several vulnerabilities. Uh, most importantly, precarious forms of employment, uh, low incomes, which result in low savings, uh, and uh, lack of access to a social safety net where they resided. Uh, so all of these three things came uh, immediately on their head uh, with very, very disastrous uh, consequences. And I don't have to go much into all that. Everybody knows that. Um, beyond the migrant crisis, what do we know about the nature of the impact? Uh, so it is true that the urban poor were by and large worse affected compared to the rural poor. Uh, again, for two reasons. One, um, the nature of urban employment, a lot of nature of urban employment, informal employment, which had to do with retail trade, uh, transportation, um, hospitality and restaurants, which employ a lot of people, they were entirely shut down and continue to be affected. Uh, while agriculture was not affected to that same extent in that, um, in that uh, total way, let, let me put it this way, because agriculture had effects, which I will come to in a couple of minutes, uh, but they were of a more heterogeneous variety. Uh, the urban informal economy, on the other hand, uh, was largely shut down uh, for two months and then has only slowly been opening up, which with, with very immediate consequences for the urban poor. Uh, combined with this, the fact what Karthik mentioned, which is that our, um, uh, our social protection policies are much better implemented in, uh, the, there are more programs that exist for rural areas and they're better implemented in rural areas uh, for a variety of historical reasons. Um, so that was also the other problem with the urban poor. Uh, so that is that is along the rural urban divide largely why the urban poor suffered more. Uh, on the agricultural front, uh, again, I think most of the facts will be familiar to people, but just so that we are all on the same page, um, there was sudden uh, the sudden lockdown in the end of March meant that the harvesting uh, season was severely impacted in some parts of the country, uh, and where and it was different kinds of impacts. Either harvesting was not possible, or recently harvested crop was not transportable. Uh, or if you did transport it, then the APMCs were largely closed uh, and so forth. So there was a combination of uh, uh, factors that resulted in an income loss for farmers uh, at that time. Uh, so that was the immediate lockdown scenario. And then the subsequent scenario in June was that the, uh, the, the lingering effects, uh, both the direct pandemic and the lockdown uh, impact was that the sowing uh, of the Kharif uh, crop also was affected because either due to shortage of labor, there were contradictory effects here depending on where you were. Uh, some places benefited from the return of migrants. So that's that's one big thing that did happen. Uh, other places had shortage of labor. Um, Punjab being the uh, paradigmatic case of where there are a large number of migrant workers who come from Bihar and other places. And all of us read stories of uh, you know privately sponsored transport to get workers to the fields and so forth. So employers tried all kinds of things. Um, and this is not just farmers, manufacturing sector, all kinds of employers uh, tried all kinds of things to get workers back uh, from their homes uh, in June when production started. 
Uh, so farming was affected in these different heterogeneous ways, um, with the result that it's hard to tell what is sort of an aggregate impact as far as agriculture is concerned. And that's also why in the GDP data you find the the first quarter data, agriculture is the only sector that has registered a positive rate of growth. Um, so it, it tells you that there there are you know multiple things going on here. Uh, which on the net actually turned out to be positive compared to the other sectors, which were all uniformly negative. Um, so uh, that's as far as the rural, urban, and the sectoral story goes. Um, the ILO has a sectoral classification of vulnerability, uh, sectoral risk classification, which is quite good. People can look at it if they're interested. Um, and that seems to match the Indian experience broadly. Uh, it classifies sectors into medium, low, high risk uh, kind of thing. Um, so obviously tourism, travel, hospitality, uh, and so forth are the worst affected, uh, manufacturing much less so, uh, in fact, the, uh, early data, high frequency data on output is quite good for manufacturing. People would have seen this in the papers, uh, two wheeler sales are back, uh, with a healthy growth in the rural market too. Uh, so are four wheels, four wheeler sales. So are fast moving consumer goods. Uh, most of these kinds of indicator kind of uh, manufacturing output uh, has either registered a healthy growth year on year from previous uh, July, August period, uh, or at least has not declined. Um, so, you know, um, uh, tractor sales are apparently through the roof. So there's, there's a lot of pent up demand uh, that is coming, uh, that we are seeing now, which doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to obviously last. Uh, uh, nevertheless, that does has implication, that have implications for a recovery in, in some way. Uh, construction, the other large employer, uh, was also, uh, of course, very severely affected um, uh, and has picked up, but not as much. Uh, and here, the migrant issue is much more important because uh, it's a heavily migrant-driven industry. So to the extent that people are not returning, uh, you know, uh, output is going to suffer. Um, uh, so that's the sectoral picture. Uh, 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 in terms of the, uh, I want to spend a couple of moments on the magnitude of impact. You know, what do we know about how large it was, right? Uh, for the groups that felt it. So where the groups that were most affected, we saw loss of employment in the range of 60 to 80%, depending on the survey that you look at. Um, and women were much worse affected than men. The CMI data actually on this is very striking. Uh, uh, the, the, both the loss of jobs in April and the recovery in uh, subsequent uh, months, let's say July, August, the loss was much harder for women, much more women lost employment. Um, and the recovery has been much more muted for women also. Uh, and here the traditional statistics have to be interpreted carefully because most of the transitions for women have been from employment to being out of the labor force uh, and not open unemployment because that's how women typically report uh, uh, you know, so you can't look at the unemployment rate, uh, which which hides a lot of this um, out of labor force um, uh, population. Uh, we have separately written on this elsewhere. It's a statistical point. I won't belabor it unless anybody's interested in it. Um, so the employment effects were large. Uh, we don't know exactly how good the recovery has been because the follow up surveys that I have looked at mostly end around the beginning of July. And since then, August, September, have been fairly good recovery months in many sectors. So I, I'm not sure exactly what the employment effects are looking like. As far as CMI is concerned, of course, we are uh, back to pre-pandemic levels of aggregate unemployment. Uh, so take that for whatever it's worth. Um, on the income, I want to spend a minute because income effects were large. By most surveys, people saw incomes halve. Uh, so you, you've seen a huge hole in income for the next last few months for the vast majority of the working population, 50% or less of their uh, usual income. Uh, and I'm emphasizing this because if you look in cross country perspective, the World Bank has been keeping track of the size of the cash transfer measures that different countries have undertaken. And what you typically find is that the cash, the amount of cash transfer in the low to middle income country bracket, which is where India falls, is something to the order of 40% of GDP per capita for three months that has been given as cash transfers, which in India's case would be about 6,000 rupees per month for three months, uh, uh, which should have been the, the level of support provided at least. Uh, of course, what was actually provided was a, a very small fraction of that. Even if you count not just the Jandhan 
transfer in garib kalyan package but also the state level augmentation which many states did do but we don't have any data on whether those promised measures actually reached or not with jandan we actually know that they did reach but the amount is very small so compared to the whole of the hit that the incomes have taken uh, the measures have no where been sufficient what has actually worked as far as social safety nets are concerned is of course pds and narega pds and narega were the largest programs that we had going into the crisis for social safety uh, purposes and they have played their role to the extent that was possible given their shortcomings predominantly in the pds case being inter interstate portability not being present with the effects that everybody knows um and in the case of narega um the uh, the primary bottleneck so to speak or the shortcoming has actually come from the budget side which is where it usually does uh, that uh, we've run short of money even despite the additional 40000 crores um uh, 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 it seems that a lot of households have exhausted or near exhausting 100 days of work so the demand here is a very clear one um uh, invoke the provision within the act for 150 days in in disaster period which can be done without any change uh, and uh, link the state uh, link the program wage back to the state minimum wage which it has been dealing since 2010 with very bad effects narega wages are very very uh, low much lower in many states compared to state minimum wages um, uh, you know which hampers their ability to really be an effective protection measure so uh, so narega and pds worked reasonably well where they worked uh, the urban context last point i will make and then i'll stop uh there was no uh, comparable employment guarantee obviously um and for uh, you know good reasons i suppose in the sense that there's a very clear case for lean season uh, in public works provisioning in the rural areas which really doesn't exist for urban areas so um uh, you know most of the time when i speak about urban employment guarantee to economists and so forth uh, the standard objections i get are the urban labor market is not like the rural labor market there are no clear periods of lean season or anything like that uh, if you don't have one work you have another kind of work so there is always employment to be had what problem are you trying going trying to solve with this guarantee now of course when we proposed it covid was nowhere on the horizon so i couldn't have said we were planning it for the magical time when nobody has any work for two months uh, you know that, that 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 never happens uh, if we had it it would have been great uh, however i feel that even in normal times there is a good uh, logic to be had for why an urban scheme should be there uh, and i'm happy to go into the details of it later uh, because i don't want to take up too much time at the beginning um we think that an urban employment guarantee will be useful to push up the urban informal sector wage rate and to remove some amount of underemployment that you see in urban areas so it's true that you there's always work to be had but the average casual worker in an urban labor market usually does not work for 25 or 26 days a month they typically work for 15 or 20 days of the month so there there is definitely uh, you know some slack there which uh, which a public option could fill in uh, augmenting incomes and tightening the labor market uh, you know e even in normal times so the scheme that we proposed is for that and um, uh, equally importantly it also taps into the other aspect of narega which is public assets creation which is a often underemphasized aspect Uh, but we think that the urban employment guarantee will perform a very important function of urban public goods creation and ecological goods and services provisioning which is a huge deficit right now in 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 india uh, especially in urban areas so those both of those objectives can be achieved we feel by, by a scheme like this uh, of course needless to say we are really pushing for it right now uh, because the urban labor market has still not recovered uh, completely from this uh, shock now whether that means there will be uptake of this scheme or not i don't know uh, because who is feeling the shock uh, that depends on you know whether people show up for such a scheme or not uh, where i am sitting in bangalore what i am seeing is a lot of uh, people who used to drive cabs are doing things like selling vegetables now are they going to show up for an urban employment guarantee scheme i don't think so they'll probably uh, not do that right so we we, are, we have to be clear on who we are talking about as the intended beneficiaries of this scheme Uh, and we had in mind urban casual workers uh, now if they are not in the cities if they are still back in the villages then you know we have to think through those those issues uh, one last point on the urban employment guarantee um, there are states who have gone ahead and done something like this even though the government of india has not announced it um, jharkhand on sect october 2nd announced a state level urban employment guarantee scheme uh, before that himachal had announced one 
and Odisha had announced one, which is a COVID period um, public work scheme. Uh, Kerala, of course, already has an urban employment guarantee scheme for about 10 years. So we have some state level experience on what this looks like. Um, we can learn some lessons on who takes up the scheme, uh, etc. Uh, of course, the state level schemes are not guarantees because there's no space in the FISC there. As Karthik mentioned, uh, states are very fiscally constrained. So these schemes are mostly 100 crore, 150 crore scheme, uh, size schemes. Uh, any reasonable guarantee entity that has that fiscal space is the government of India. <laughs> and the very last point that I want to make is uh, the fiscal deficit is going to go through the roof. Anything that you say right now, people are going to say we don't have the money uh, because it was already at 6 or 7% of uh, uh, GDP. It's going to go to 12 or 13%. Uh, and the debt to GDP ratio is going to really go up because the GDP is going to contract. So it's going to go up to 90% or something like that, uh, which are all very alarming numbers in normal times. Uh, but what do we do, uh, right? And, and my submission is that, uh, you know, we have to bite the bullet and spend. We haven't spent as much as other countries have spent. We need to spend more. Uh, and, you know, I won't say consequences be damned, We'll have to live out the consequences, but if we spend intelligently, then maybe we can mitigate some of the bad ones. So I'm sorry I took too much time, Karthik, but I'm done. This is great. Thank you so much. I, I think it's a good, it's a good start now. Uh, so, uh, Sai, do you want to take it from here? Sure. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I can uh, share my screen uh, and then just uh, sure. I mean, whatever works, Karthik, because I'm also happy to get back uh, Arindam and I can also um, use these maps um, later during the discussion. Do you have a preference, Arindam? Do you want me to share them now or just um, open up with some broad brush strokes of our research? Um, I feel um, my thoughts are that Amit's um, very uh, focused and um, extensive notes on recent processes. Um, our research is not directed in that way, right? Um, but it might be useful to present our stuff, I think just to give us the leeway to discuss things later. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I think we, I mean, I guess we could uh, foreground whatever we are saying is that we are, we are interested in more long-term structural aspects guiding the nature of the Indian economy, right? And so the real questions are, you know, how did this recent event, for a historian that's very, very critical, it's a crisis. So what does the crisis bring to the structure? It's a kind of interesting problem. Uh, but also it might give us, uh, um, um, I have some thoughts on, on from a different methodological sense uh, um, um, in terms of who is the migrant? You know, so it might be useful. So in, in, in Amit's uh, work, I mean, it's absolutely necessary the CMI, the migrant is a, is a quantitative entity, um, you know, so that's one, I mean, that's, that, I mean, that's one definition of the migrant. Uh, our work, I feel, you know, looks at other motivations for migrancy. I mean, there's out migration from Bihar, but there's also out migration from Punjab and Gujarat. And there's, out -mig there's migration to Kerala, there's migration to Punjab, there's migration from the Punjab, from Gujarat, there's migrations to Kerala, there's migrations from Kerala. So those, there's broader geographies. I think it, it'll be helpful for us, I think, to, to put our research there to sort of play some of that out. Uh, and, and I think once we're done, then we can open up the discussion. Okay, so, so Karthik, um, you want to you just go ahead? share some maps then. Okay. Uh, so firstly, thank you to um, Karthik, Patrick, um, Leah um, for having us uh, be a part of this conversation. Um, so this is research that Arindam and I have been doing uh, for the past um, um, three years. It looks at the geographies of uneven development in India. And uh, to Karthik's point on whether we are seeing a convergence or divergence uh, with the lockdown, some of these geographies of uneven development and particularly the spatial fault lines of development, right? The spatial fault lines of development uh, have been brutally exposed during the lockdown induced migration crisis. 
so because this is a work in progress, what I'll do is I'll just present a series of uh, maps, uh, more as a way of posing questions around some key locational puzzles uh, for us. And then Arindam can follow up with further elaborations on some of the main themes of the research. Uh, next slide, please, Karthik. So the first uh, puzzle that got uh, Arindam and me interested in the research is the puzzle of the lower Gangetic Plain, right? And the lower Gangetic Plain has now, of course, become uh, uh, very visible since March uh, because some of the poorest districts of eastern Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, from where some of the largest waves of internal migration take place, are in the lower Gangetic Plain. Um, and for instance, even if you look at the Prime Minister's recent Garib Kalyan uh, uh, safety net package of the 116 districts, right, with the highest rates of internal migration, with the exception of Jharkhand, most of these districts are the lower Gangetic Plain. So the, this, this then raises the question of why the lower Gangetic Plain has seen this large exodus of distressed migrant labor. And for us, it's a particularly important uh, economic geography puzzle, uh, because if there's a region of the country which according to conventional tenets of economic geography, you would expect to agglomerate, um, it would be the lower Gangetic Plain, right? So as you can see in this map, um, and I should credit our um, very, very good RA team here, which produced these uh, maps. They've been working with us for the past three years. So for instance, if you look at uh, this map with population density, the lower Gangetic Plain has one of the highest population densities, uh, not just in the country, but in the world, right? So certain parts of the lower Gangetic Plain have a population of almost 3,000 uh, people per square kilometer which is almost double that of the London metropolitan area. Um, it has reliable rainfall. It's proximate to a major river corridor. It has a dense network of colonial era uh, railway lines. And so for all of these reasons, you would expect the region to agglomerate, but it hasn't, right? So you use any of the conventional indices of urbanization and uh, economic mm. clustering, like the presence of first order public goods like specialized hospitals or the level of industry and the lower Gangetic Plain is far lagging behind the rest of the country. And it's particularly this combination that we have to pay attention to, right? Of a high population density with the lack of uh, economic clustering, which then results in this region becoming the region of um, surplus labor and really this large scale labor out migration. Uh, the next slide, please, Karthik. So also connected to this is uh, the other part of the puzzle of where is the migrant labor moving to in search of work, right? Where is a uh, work largely in the form of urban informal work, uh, since we're talking about migration, available in post-liberalization India? And for us, what was very interesting uh, when we started doing this mapping is that some of the highest uh, densities, the concentration of post-liberalization urban enclaves and logistics infrastructures um, are clearly not evenly spread out across the national space. This is borne out through CMIE data on firm location. Instead, they cluster in certain regions. And we argue that the post-liberalization urban and logistics enclaves are clustering in former green revolution regions. So as Karthik mentioned, if you just had to draw a broad brush map of the former green revolution regions, and there's uh, very, very rigorous prior research on, these, uh, on this, including Barbara Harris-White, Francine Frankel, it would roughly trace an arc that stretches from the Northwest of the country to the Southeast, right? And it is this arc, this former green revolution arc that also includes some of the most prosperous corridor regions, right? Such as Meerat Jalandhar, Mumbai, Pune, Bengaluru, Chennai, Vishakhapatnam, Chennai. And these are also the regions that have some of the most powerful agrarian caste constituencies, such as the Jats, Patels, Marathas, um, here in Bengaluru, Southern Karnataka, the Vokaligas, the Kammas, and the Gounders. So for us, then, the, the, a, a key analytic in our research, if we had to understand this territorial overlap between urban enclaves and the Green Revolution, is caste or jati-based capital accumulation, 
right? So we're particularly interested in how certain jatis, uh, middle peasant jatis, were able to consolidate power over successive eras of agricultural modernization and now urbanization through the capture of state subsidies. And during the first phase of the Green Revolution, this was capturing massive state subsidies in the form of the Green Revolution um, input packages of seed water fertilizer. So this, for instance, is, is just uh, one representative um, map of uh, this kind of jati mapping of Maharashtra by district. Uh, there are lots of approximations in this map, um, and we are happy to discuss this um, further uh, during the uh, during the discussion. But but largely, what we are looking at is transects, right? Regional transects that cut across state boundaries as a way of uh, mapping out this jati-based agrarian urban capital accumulation. And the next slide, Kartik, which is the last one. And, and, and so if you had to uh, uh, further historicize this, this then raises the prior question on the geography of the Green Revolution itself. And what we found through research, um, uh, including in the Rockefeller archives, is that the main criterion for the selection of the Green Revolution pilot projects, the early IADP uh, districts, was the presence of what, what, what they call assured water supply, right? And the regions with assured water supply, surprisingly, were semi-arid regions, what ag agroeconomists would call semi-arid regions, which were the beneficiaries of colonial era canal irrigation. So, so here it's very helpful to look at a piece of maps um, it's an atlas produced by Daniel Thorner and Chen on South Asia's 21 ecological and agrarian regions, circa 1930. And I just uploaded a, a couple of the uh, maps from this atlas. But, but what is very clear from the atlas is that during the late 19th century, uh, the colonial state massively invested in an outlay of irrigation canals in select arid regions, right? And this skewed geography of colonial era canals coalesced around various considerations, including famines, peasant insurgencies, and also the land revenue generating potential of the newly irrigated tracks. And it is these colonial era canals that Tonner and uh, Chen uh, map. But if you just look at two of these maps, it's interesting to really uh, map out this concatenated sequence of capital accumulation that we find, uh, tried to track, right? So, so the map on the left is the semi-arid region of uh, the upper Gangetic Plain from the Gangetic Doha up to the Punjab. Uh, the other one is coastal Andhra Pradesh. Both of, both of these regions were beneficiaries of new canals in the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, what you see in the red dots is the IADP Green Revolution districts, which overlaps onto these canal geographies. Um, and these regions, as many of you are familiar, are also some of the most intense uh, sites of speculative uh, real estate corridors today, right? Including uh, Gurgaon and uh, the new capital city of Amravati. And in contrast, as a riparian region with reliable monsoons, uh, the lower Gangetic Plain was largely bypassed by colonial era state inputs. Right? Um, now, one of the things that I should also add is um, it's important not to flatten this narrative. Um, and, and so we're also interested in regional aberrations and it's worth talking about what these regional aberrations could be. Uh, but let me just end here that what you do see is quite a remarkable path legacy, right? Largely uh, consolidated around Jati clusters uh, from these early canal geographies to the post-liberalization geographies of um, urban development. So, so I'll stop here and um, Arindam can perhaps pick it up. Thanks, Karthik. Yeah. Um I think I'll, um, as quickly as I can, um, um, offer a little bit of the findings in terms of, um, I mean, we, we asked a bunch, I mean, Sai uh, very accurately pointed to our findings and a set, uh, you know, and, and um, 
um, I guess the uh, uh, the broad patterns that we sort of discovered in our research. Uh, I should add that a lot of this was in fact quite well known uh, what we are doing. I mean, it's not entirely original research. I mean, for instance, Karthik mentioned the rift, et cetera. I mean, this is well known. It's not our discovery. I mean, in policy, this is well known. Um, there's a whole kind of East of Kanpur phenomenon, et cetera, Western UP versus Eastern UP, et cetera. And, you know. um, so our real question was like, why are these patterns being established, right? Um, and if you go back to the canal districts, I mean, these, um, Karthik, in your question, you had a, uh, you had a, uh, you had a query about um, natural endowments. I mean, all of the things that Sai was talking about uh, um, in terms of why the Lower Gangetic Valley, which is now exporting the largest amount of domestic migrants, um, and that's a important clarification to make, it's domestic migrancy as opposed to international migrancy. Um, why was that sort of passed over in the path of development, both in the colonial state and the post-colonial state? Um, so I would also point out that those were, it's not only the fact that they should be the, that, that area should be the site of greater urbanization, but in fact, prior to colonial, uh, uh, the colonial advent, it was the site of um, high urbanization. I mean, this is where the big cities were. I mean, it's the big urban empires from Magad to whoever. Um, so the difference with what the colonial state brings is a kind of shift away from what we would call primitive accumulation, right? So what the colonial, I mean, there's an equalization, so there's a comparability of, of territory that the colonial state brings. So the colonial state is governing the Punjab and Bengal um, um, and unlike the Mughal state, for the first time, it is creating a certain uniformity across territories because the colonial state is responding to global markets, global prices, uh, grain prices, and so on and so forth. And, and uh, um, the, the, the reason why they build, I mean, it's an important question to ask, why did they build the canals for A and why did they build them where they built them? Um, so the answer to the first question is they built the canals period because they wanted to raise revenue. They wanted to push revenue up. Then it became a question. And so here we see a kind of supply sided um, early uh, uh, liberal economics in play. I, I don't really distinguish between liberal, so-called liberal economics and neoliberal economics because the colonial state did exactly what the post-colonial state did. Um, so they wanted to create a kind of um, assured irrigation and uh, for so that production could be extended to new areas as opposed to old areas. The Gangetic Valley was already fully agriculturalized, right? So in the drier parts from Western UP all the way to the Punjab or in parts of Gujarat, et cetera, where the canals were first built, um, the, the idea is that if you have this input, then new tracts of land can become irrigated. And so there is higher production. And it is in that process. So again, cost is being mobilized, not in some traditional way. It's in that process that certain castes, for instance, the Jats and the Gujars, who were previously pastoralists even in, substantially, they are, they, while new land is covered, is given over to cultivation, they become cultivationists from being prior pastoralists. And because it's the state, I mean, if you could think of the canal districts, I mean, there was an attempt to raise revenue from actually the rent of canal waters and, and, and this sort of basically failed. And so the, canal, so the colonial government sort of just gave up on at some point on actually renting out or, 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 or pricing the water itself, what they settled for was revenue from the added crop, right? So this actually makes groups like the Jats and the Gujars and also the Patels in Gujarat who founded them, you know, Ahmedabad Education Society. And there's a kind of rural urban between the Jain Vanya Ahmedabadis and the Charotar South Gujarat uh, Patels. I mean, there's that kind of corridor in play also. Um, so these, these, these castes are, and, and that sort of explains why middle caste dominance sort of appears in the colonial era, but they will also have major uh, 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 
um, they will also be the front of major mobilization for the nationalist movement. So for instance, the Jats through the organization with the Arya Samaj, for instance, and they become sort of the Congress mobilization in Punjab is very much driven by this Arya Samaj mobilized Jat constituency, right? And so when the, when the post-colonial state, you know, uh, when there's independence, um, it, it, it's a similar question. Initially, like for instance, in 1950s, if you look at, uh, um, if you look at studies by Amartya Sen, um, and the real question in, in the first two, uh, first three five-year plans is to ask, uh, um, uh, um, you know, should we industrialize agriculture or not, right? And then people like Amartya Sen and, and a number of other people argue that in fact, the small farm is, has the highest productivity uh, quotient as opposed to the large farm. The farm. So there's, a, there's in fact a bias against the industrialization of agriculture. So why is it in the 1960s, there is the green revolution, which is a, an effort at industrializing agriculture. It's because of a very different crisis. Uh, I mean, there are all these food shortages that happen in the 60s and the 1967 election is key here. But what is happening is because there are these critical food shortages in the countryside and across the country, there are these price inflations that sort of acting adversely towards electoral prospects. But more importantly, uh, because food has to be imported and our, our friend Atya Korakiwala has done some excellent work here because food has to be imported, other kinds of imports for industrialization are being impacted. So you cannot get capital goods because you're, you're shipping grain all the time. And that's what your, you know, your foreign exchange is going towards. So the, the, the bias of the five-year plan, which is basically anti-rural and pro-urban is being checked by these food crises that happen all the time. So what the Green Revolution does, what it is, designed to solve is not employment in agriculture, but food supply so that prices are stabilized in the domestic market. So that the exchange, you know, exchange monies can be used for industrialization. So they just pick the old colonial districts and like, and once that food crisis is solved, you know, in terms of supply from the, from a supply standpoint, that's the end of the green revolution. It doesn't extend to the rest of the country. So, these are both supply-sided uh, decisions made for different reasons. One is for revenue. And the, in the first case, in the colonial state, in the post-colonial states, it's to, it's to stabilize uh, um, uh, uh, um, prices. Um, um, so, um, so, so then again, you see these middle peasant uh, 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 groups sort of capturing uh, um, um, uh, power structures, um, including political parties and so on and so forth. And the, the trajectory of the Congress party as it breaks up into these different Jati-based agglomerations, whether, whether it be Punjab or uh, whether it be Maharashtra, or whether it be Gujarat, is in, in fact a kind of fascinating uh, uh, story. So what's the, what's the uh, so to perhaps sort of react to Amit's um, 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 very excellent quantitative findings, which again, I mean, I, I mean, he knows more than we do, but as he himself admits, we know very little. I mean, one uh, question that I would have in this story is that what does caste do in these equations in, the, in, the, in both setting up patterns of accumulation and also setting up certain patterns of migrancy? Um, so um, in, 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 uh, uh, so if, if you look at uh, places like Punjab, uh, once the, the Green Revolution starts to falter and it brings a certain level of prosperity with it, there's out migration out of the Punjab, right? But to the West, not necessarily to the rest of India, it's also abroad. And in that situation, one may ask, uh, you know, are they moving, uh, uh, why are they, uh, you know, can they not simply do, I mean, so there's a population that's moving out of the Punjab and a different population that's moving into the Punjab to do precisely the kind of lower end labor work in the farms, right? So you could, you could ask the begged question, which is like, why are the people who are moving out to the US not working in the farms and, you know, uh, and why is that problem of labor not being solved locally? 
And one answer could be that in fact, caste is a major obstruction towards downward mobility in labor practices. So that the same person who sees itself as a landowner would not go and become a servant in somebody's house within the Punjab or Delhi, they would do it in Houston. Right? I mean, they, you'd go work in the hotel industry doing similar stuff. So caste and honor become also certain kinds of, I mean, this is also slightly speculative, but it, it may actually be an obstruction towards a, a certain um, fungibility of labor practices, right? Um, um, on the other hand, uh, uh, this also explains why there is a kind of agricultural resilience within the Gangetic area as Amit was talking about that for the same reasons that uh, Amartya Sen found uh, this to be the case uh, that there is higher productivity quotient from small farms that are family owned so the whole family can possibly live off smaller farms and, and subsist uh, if there was not other kinds of you know needs for cash to transact in in a larger so there's more resilience there Possibly, I'm not saying, but possibly I'm trying to sort of understand Amit's figures. And it's not surprising then tractor sales, for instance, would go through the roof precisely because the labor supply has been, has been curtailed, right? So there's a kind of, uh, you, you substitute technology where labor cannot arrive. Um, the last thing uh, I, I should say, um, it, this is a response to uh, the observation about the construction sector. Um, and this sort of begs um, the question of what is urban and what is rural in this equation. Um, our argument, broadly speaking in our research is that there is no clear demarcation that can be drawn between so-called urban and so-called rural. Um, uh, uh, a lot of what we call urbanization, Sai and I are describing as de-ruralization rather than this, it's, it's almost urbanization in place in places of greater prosperity. So if you have a large firm, you sell it and you put up a five-star hotel where you are, rather than moving capital necessarily to particular centers. And so uh, uh, why is this happening? Uh, perhaps um, uh, one reason is the continued lack of, uh, the continued um, inability of the post-independent state to what it was trying to do throughout and has been trying uh, all the way from the first five-year plan to Modi's Make in India initiative is to shift from agriculture to manufacturing as the primary basis of the economy. This has continuously failed as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, uh, uh, as an effort. And there are many reasons why. I mean, it, it's not just you know, what one wants to do and one fails. Um, so in, its, in lieu of the absence of manufacturing, um, Walt Rostow had this idea uh, called the, the something called the lead sector. It's a slightly dated idea. I mean, people probably laugh at it, but uh, I mean, for instance, 19th century, in, the 19, in 19th century industrialization, the textile sector was the lead sector, right? Um, that sort of pulled, lifted all boats across the world. And this includes places like Ahmedabad or Bombay or Calcutta, you name it. Right, but even what happens with agriculture also happens with textiles in the 1980s. And what liberalization really sort of brings about from the late 90s, not from the early 90s, not from 1993, but more like 1998 onwards, is the push of real estate as the real as the lead sector. And real estate is, in that sense, a kind of it's an umbrella sector because it lifts. You could call to, if a, is a five star hotel a tourist sector industry or is it a real estate? Is a hospital a tourist sector, in, a, a, a health sector industry or is it basically a building that you build which you put doctors in, et cetera? So real estate is the driving edge um, where a kind of post-industrial capital which is basically capital that is not manufacturing and has to do with the failure of the arrival of manufacturing meets a kind of pre-industrial form of labor which is this uh, 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 um, uh, exodus from small agrarian uh, areas where there's excess labor capacity. So that's the kind of exchange that we're interested in. I'll stop here and wait. I, I, already, I think all of us have spoken more than we should. Um, so I don't know. Uh, but I'll stop there uh, just to kind of 
uh, 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 but I thought it would be important to sort of get some of those methodological presumptions of our research, right? Because it, it can perhaps eliminate some of the problems that Amit is trying to uh, sort of brought forth for us, and we would understand that um, data in, in, in these terms. So I'll stop there. Thank you, uh, Amit, Sai, and Arifa. Um, I, I, I'll ask one. So we are uh, almost one, one, past one hour into the, in the session. So I'll just ask one question and then open up the uh, floor for questions from the audience. And uh, the question I want to ask is kind of to tie everything back in uh, because uh, we you know, frame this panel as a uh, uh, a discussion about uh, the historical roots of the present crisis. Um, and uh, so just to sort of bring things back to the present. Now, um, one of the things that uh, I found striking um, in size and Arizona's presentation is this um, sort of the, the deep historical roots of um, the, the present patterns of migration, right? Uh, now, what we are seeing today is, uh, but, but the assumption there is that uh, capital, uh, in a sense, I mean, and Arindam said that just now, that, that um, it, it's not that, the, that this is certain assumption that capital um, remains in place. Um, so, um, if, if there's capital accumulation happening in the Godavari Delta, then it kind of leads to organization in the Godavari Delta. And, uh, and, and, it, and that kind of uh, urbanization, that, I mean, if you want to call it urbanization, uh, it has certain consequences because um, it, it, it needs labor in its most casual form, uh, which means that these are casual migrants uh, coming from, um, very far away, but not coming there to stay. Um, uh, but, but they're coming there to work for a, for a while and then to go back, right? And uh, so people like Munshi and Rosenzweig have all, I mean, they've, they've kind of argued that, that this, um, this kind of migration pattern that we see in India, and it is really only in India that we see it to this extent, um, kind of help prevents the Indian economy from reaping the, the kind of the full benefits of capitalist globalization. So there's a certain uh, implication there. I mean, they use these wage differentials that you see in urban rural across between urban and rural areas uh, in India, which are not found anywhere else. Uh, so in Indonesia, for instance, the urban the wage differential between urban and rural areas is uh, not very high. Uh, similarly with China or with most of the world, but in India it's like phenomenally high. And that's partly because uh, people don't take advantage of that wage differential to come and settle in the city. Uh, and I was just wondering, um, is there in a sense uh, something, uh, I mean, the, the so uh, traditionally we've, we've kind of been happy with that policymakers uh, prefer um, sort of keeping capital in place, so to speak, in India, traditionally. Um, do we really, I mean, is there presently a move to really make capital mobile fully to unleash it, uh, fully within the, the, the national space? And if so, is that really uh, even partly an answer to, to the, the problems we face? So think, think about it this way, right? Like, would the UP worker be better off if all of this capital that's getting accumulated in the Godavari Delta or in Gujarat, uh, wouldn't it be better, better mobilized and uh, better utilized if that capital can migrate to UP rather than the workers having to migrate uh, back to uh, these places? So that's just a, a thought that I had. I know that, that there's some sh uh, shaking of heads going on. So. Uh, I'd like to hear all of your responses. No, it's, it's, it's a nodding of heads. And a, Sai, do you mind if I answer this? Um, no, I'll yeah. go after you. 
yeah. So um, uh, that's exactly right. Um, and so I, I'm not I'm not a big votary of these Spin Hamlin sort of arguments or the Polanyi's argument, as if like the whole world is composed of little Englands, you know, and each of them, you know, every, in every part of the world, we will we will sort of create these microcosms of agrarian exit towards industrialization and every part will replicate exactly the same pattern. The global economy is one and Spin Hamlin in that sense happened only once for the global economy. And if you think about how these huge exodus of agrarian migrants from England could not be accommodated within England, right? I mean, they've, they've spread out over the world and, 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 you know, and, and then to feed whatever was left, you had to create global markets, you had to, you had to colonize India, for instance. So two questions, I mean, who will India colonize? A, B, um, if you consider the kind of debts, and you know, the, the other kind of question to ask is how many people do you want to kill in order to make such a policy sort of work? So the, on a, I, I, I think that it would be a mistake to sort of just replicate some, some prior model of how industrialization happens and sort of see it replicating everywhere. Uh, the real question in India should be, or anywhere should be, uh, why does this not happen, right? Um, so let us say that the, the problem of manufacturing has been more or less solved by China by simply, you know, making production available at such cheap rates to, for the rest of the planet. So in a way, manufacturing has passed over India. The other thing is that there's increasing automation. So manufacturing itself is not, you know, it, it's, a, I mean, if you have more automation and you have more industry, that doesn't mean you're gonna have more employment. So, I mean, there's a sort of broader arc, arc of post-industry that's sort of in play. Um, then the question is like, why should, a Gujarati uh, person with capital not move to UP, I mean, which is the kind of, and, and invest there. And it is here that, again, the question of what does caste do, that is absolutely critical. What does caste do? I mean, uh, Bhargav is on the, in the audience today and he will remember this incident that happened only this last January. We were, we were driving together to Udaipur from Ahmedabad and we rented a, 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 a vehicle to go there. And we were very insistent. I'm sort of very American that way. Like you must have seat belts. I'm not going on the highway without a seat belt. And of course, when this guy shows up, the car is now no functioning seat belts. And so we were like, we are not going in this car. And he said, and, the, and this guy says like, no, no, don't worry about it. Trust me, I'm a Rajput. And you know, it's like, and in this classic Dungarpuri accent that you're gonna, who Rajputsu? su? I mean, and you just wonder like, why is he saying this when, you know, what I need is a seatbelt. Why is he saying he's a Rajput? But that, you know, when we look for jobs, when we look for jobs, we have resumes. We are like, we've done this, 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 this. In a, in a sort of um, 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 non-industrial, informal, casual uh, situation, the question, you know, what is a resume that somebody might pull on in order to say like, I am who I say I am. It is cast because and what is lacking here in what, what caste is answering is a general absence of trust across the economy, which is, which is to say that certain co contracts do not play out in the formalized way that they do in other areas. So caste stands in for contract. So even if you look at migrant labor coming from Bihar to, uh, to, to, uh, to Bombay, and this is by the way, not unique to India, it happens in China. Um, um, you have, you know, people from a certain caste mobilizing people from their caste from the village to come there. And so your chacha or your uh, uh, whatever, your mama is actually also the labor contractor. And so the, the whole idea that caste is, a, these kinship structures would be an insurance is sort of a begged question because there's also exploitation within kinship that operates. And so for the same reason that, you know, caste is mobilized, I mean, the, the real question is that what incentive does let's say a capitalist who draws capital from Gujarat and Bombay, or Mumbai, have to move to UP where basically those relationships may not exist, right? I mean, so it takes a while for that path dependency to happen. A good example here is Marwari capital in Bengal and the Gangetic area, which we've sort of, you know, but the Marwari's actually established these buses. I mean, there are places, I mean, the men used to stay, you know, in, 
in Bengal, where the women stayed back in uh, uh, in Rajasthan, in the uh, in the uh, Shekhawat region. So there are these patterns to which capital accumulates, which actually allow for capital circulates within contracts and kinship is a, has a huge role for that kind of stuff to happen. This cannot be solved just by policy. I'm sorry to say. I mean, unless like your courts start functioning magically, beautifully, uh, you know, the contracts are being honored across it. It cannot, it, these, are, these are much larger historical processes. I'll just stop there. So, uh, yeah, and contracts sort of never system. function properly anyway, right? Um, but that is also true, yes. yes. Um, no, but you know, it's interesting, Karthik, this question that you ask on, you know, instead of this distress out labor migration, um, and there have been some very, very eminently sensible suggestions by uh, economists whom I hugely admire um, in the wake of the migrant crisis, uh, arguing for using um, uh, Manrega uh, really as a kind of a catalyst to develop uh, 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 industrial clusters, right? For instance, in Eastern Uttar Pradesh and Bihar. Uh, but again, uh, I mean, this is precisely why caste and jati is so important for our research. Uh, you look at works, you look at really fine-grained research on some of the most globally competitive industrial clusters in India, regional industrial clusters, right? Meenu Tiwari, the Ludhiana uh, knitwear cluster, uh, Sharachari's work on uh, the Gounders and uh, Tirupur, completely rooted in former green revolution uh, regions and rooted in those, so, so there is an agrarian origin to the industrial clusters that they are pointing to, right? And there is a much longer arc uh, uh, to this, so 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 that's one, and also to add to Arindam's point, yes, there is an in situ capital accumulation that we are seeing, um, but one of the things that I'd like, uh, I mean, there is private capital coming in, right? So the power of this kind of what Professor K. Balakopal would call the provincial property class very much resides in the regulatory power of these agrarian elites, right? So you look at Western Maharashtra, there is a diversification from sugar to horticulture to real estate, uh, but a lot of that, but the private capital is coming from elsewhere, right? It's coming from outside even, uh, but what the agrarian, the rise of, you know, this peasant to agrarian capitalist trajectory, like why it's important is really the regulatory power uh, that they wield in the state legislatures, right? And, and that's the reason why capital is sticky, right? That's, that's the reason capital is not moving to the lower Gangetic plane. Uh, one final, just a little thought um, about these fine um, um, cash payments. Uh, one sort of rather unexamined aspect of Manrega that I think, you know, that we still don't, I don't know what to make of it. And I think like nobody does, which is why it's not being it's sort of being swept under the carpet. Is that one of the reasons why the UPA may have lost the election with the poor was, was probably Manrega. I mean, I mean, it had all kinds of inflationary effects and et cetera, which sort of, you know, which are one thing. But if you think of it, that the, it was the beneficiaries of Manrega who actually voted for a new government, which had on its electoral, electoral uh, manifesto that it was going to get rid of Manrega. I mean, that was Modi's initial premise until he decided he needed to keep it on. That's one thing I can't wrap my head around. Like, how do these, and maybe Amit can, you know, I mean, I, yeah, and so uh, finally, we, we can uh, just because we have exactly less than 10 minutes left at this point. So I think it's uh, if we can just get a couple of questions from the audience and then um, uh, Amit, sorry, uh, I didn't give you a chance to respond. Uh, so uh, I'm just opening the floor to questions from the audience. Uh, um, if we can just allow uh, people to uh, speak up, to unmute themselves and speak up. Uh, and if you're not able to do that, you can just type it in the chat box and uh, I'll, I'll read out the question. Can, can, can I 
Did I ask something? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry to come late into the panel and just ask the first question. But uh, related to the NRDG point, I think was it because of the endemic corruption in in implementation of NRDG at different state levels? Because that's what also uh, a lot of the social audit surveys of uh, Jo and Ritika's uh, revealed, right? I mean, to a large extent, and states like. Uh, um, Chhattisgarh and others had a lot of corruption. Bihar, Chhattisgarh had a lot of corruption uh, involved in the implementation of uh, an RGA, which might have probably tied into. But I'm like, yeah, I mean, I also don't know it properly. But I think uh, might have uh, connected to the corruption narrative for voting out uh, UPA uh, at the national level, right? Um, if we can just take the next question and then we'll we'll get to the next question. Is Kartik? Uh, can I ask? Yes. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so this is uh, means this this is uh, following Professor Am Amit Basule's talk that he was telling about the possibility of agricultural production rising in some regions due to influx of migrants. So then uh, is this a good test for the diseased unemployment story? That is whether more employment actually leads to more agricultural output or not. So this is a, I find it an interesting case in the modern era of whether diseased unemployment actually exists or not. And the second point is that I was just wondering is that while even if agricultural productivity rises, supposing that in the region wages are, in the region suppose it is predominantly uh, agricultural laborers who are working and wages are determined by demand and supply of labor, supply of labor and demand for labor. Then here is a supply of labor shock actually. So rise in supply of labor. So whether total wage earnings will rise or not will be determined by the elasticity of labor demand. So I was wondering that it's not certain whether actually the people got wage earners actually got a rise in income or a fall in income. So yeah, these are the two points I want. So uh, we will uh, stop your questions here and then we'll get to the answers. No, so very quickly, actually, I don't know the answers to either question. They are both good questions and they require much more careful empirical work than anybody has done, I think, so far. What I can say is that with regard to the first point that you mentioned, I wasn't really suggesting that productivity rose. All I was saying was that Agriculture was the only sector in the quarterly data which registered a positive rate of growth. Uh, and there could be many things going on there. Uh, so I don't want to suggest uh, that, you know, Indian agriculture was labor constrained and people came back and somehow we got a boost. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't mean to suggest that. Uh, although the question you ask is worth asking. And the second part is much more interesting to me, which is what exactly happened in the local labor market after the reverse migration took place. Uh, and there, uh, of course, Narega is a, again a big part of the story, uh, which we know. But uh, I, I recall a pretty good article by Sharantan Bera in the Mint a few weeks back or months back. It was one of those long stories uh, on agriculture, uh, which had some, some bit of anecdotal evidence on what was happening to earnings uh, in the agricultural uh, sector, at least wherever he had looked at. Um, and you are right. I mean, the effects are hard to predict. I, I think one would say other things, equal wages, wage rate should have fallen. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if that did happen. Um, but I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you can look up that article, and, but I don't think there have been any serious uh, academic studies of this yet. Uh, but it's worth asking. Yeah. Um, Sartak, as per your question about quantitative Corruption, I think corruption, I think you use the word corruption narrative. I think, it, yes, it is a narrative because on some level we have to get beyond the idea of corruption as something there that is measurable and we have to rather, so, you know, you could say that uh, the, uh, the mobilization of MSP that benefits particular uh, middle jati caste is corruption. 
On the other hand, it is what is necessary to assemble power in those territories, right? So uh, it, it is, I mean, so you may be right that it, the narrative played, but on the other hand, it sort of begs the question of, um, uh, of design um, and particularly when it is central government, I mean, Amit was talking about sort of the, you know, fiscal space in the central government as opposed to state governments. I'd like to show this image of this bridge on the Ganga on, in Patna, which basically they built the bridge on the, across the Ganga because the Ganga is in fact federal or central space. But the ramps going down, the land mafia have captured land on either side and they're not letting the ramps be built until a kind of rent is paid, right? But then the big question, I mean, so you would think of that as corruption. I mean, oh my God, you know, X party is holding this for answer. But the big question is, this is central government space, right? The contractor who gets the contract to build the bridge is given out by Delhi. So whatever sort of play of capital, et cetera, feed of this thing is happening at the center. So, the, so this, is a, this is a center state boundary right there between the bridge and its ramp, which is, doesn't exist. So the state players or the local players may well ask like, where's my portion of whatever this is, right? And so I'm gonna stop it until I get it. So it, there is a kind of design problem as to how power may be assembled. But you know, if money goes down, then the question is how do you assemble consent from the other side, which siphons off a lot of, but Mandrega broadly speaking, I think people like um, uh, I mean, the uh, uh, Poverty Action Lab, et cetera, have sort of established that there were enough goods that did filter down to actually create a little bit of a income bump in, in certain areas. Uh, maybe, definitely, clearly not all of it. And so that may have fed it. But that's the big question we're asking is how is power assembled when the government, I mean, this is where I think policy as, as a kind of policy always like to see itself as neutral design, right? And what I are trying to do is, is how policy is always mandated by the assemblage of power and how this plays out in the, in the, in across terrains. And that's the kind of more qualitative aspect there. And for, for that, it's very important to move beyond moralistic terms such as corruption, nepotism, et cetera. It's all corruption, it's all nepotism, everything. Mm -hmm. You and I are corrupt every, you know, it's, it, by those definitions somewhere. So we, we are looking at alternative terms to understand this. Um, uh, I just, uh, Maya Latnam had a question, if, uh, if you're able to uh, share it with the panel. <clears throat> uh, yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for organizing this, Karthik. It's good to see you. And thank you, Amit, uh, Sai, and Arindam. It's really a, a great talk. I, I had a question for Arindam. Um, about the great question that uh, Kartik posed about why is it that the capital accumulated in Gujarat and the Godavari Delta doesn't go to the Gangetic Plain. And the, the answer you gave was really, uh, I mean, the, the hypothesis you put was really interesting, right? And sort of shows the, the unique nature of India about the specificity of caste in, in, in not allowing this movement of capital within the country. But uh, could there be also the hypothesis of um, global financialization that produces this. I was just looking at data from the RBI from 2012 onwards, and you see that one of the thing that rises the most is the number of outbound remittances from India. And if apart from the position of um, funding studies abroad or travel, the two biggest uh, growths in the past 10 years or so are in um, deposits and investment in equity and debt. So aside from the explanation of uniqueness of India, could it also be that now there is another exit that is more lucrative in an age where it's very hard to find high rates of return and that investing it in a product that uh, you know, finances some debt somewhere else in the world is more lucrative and will always be more lucrative than investing it in the Gangetic Plain. And what does that say about, you know, policy tools such as capital controls and, and what does that give to you know Indian development? It's a hypothesis as well, but it, does it clash with the one you're saying or does it go together? I was just curious to know. But you, you just hit on like Utsa Patnaik's argument from 1971 and this is exactly what the Green Revolution was doing, right? right. That instead of circulating surpluses back into agriculture by further investing of capital goods, the, the, these kind of uh, people who benefited monetarily were actually routing money elsewhere. 
So this is the classic semi-feudal argument. I think it still applies on, on some level, uh, but it, this, is, this is a very persistent pattern that in fact is being pulled out. Uh, in the 70s, there's this kind of semi-feudal, semi-capitalist uh, debate, which is worth looking at, by the way, but this was exactly what they were saying was happening. So it doesn't need global finance. It could be even the state's first mobilization of fiscal territory and fiscal capital, which happened with independence, and it was exactly playing out that way. Sorry. I, I really wish I didn't have to cut short the discussion, but uh, we are out of time. And uh, so I'm going to request my colleague Sartre, who is the convener of this Arts and Sciences uh, seminar series, to give us the vote of thanks. I, uh, thank you. Thank you, Karthik. And uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, I'm just coming out of a panel on Bihar elections and uh, how they gonna, I, I could relate to you know what was discussed here and the centrality of caste that we talk about, whether it is in who gets to be a politician, who, who gets to be the voter, or even who gets to be the contractor, because we have seen that in Nitish Raj is also the contractor Raj, right? The Rajput contractor, the San Mafia, and others have also increased. And uh, the contracting business shifted from the Yadavs to the Rajputs uh, in, in that BJP uh, Nitish uh, era. Uh, so this is, I think, a very fascinating discussion, and uh, I'm sorry for having missed out on uh, substantial parts of it, but uh, I really thank uh, uh, Arindam, uh, Sai, and Amit and, uh, for coming, taking time out to you know, uh, engage in this wonderful discussion, and also uh, to Karthik, who has uh, the, you know, thought about this and designed and structured this entire discussion uh, on a very pertinent topic, I think, which is... Uh, you know about uh, how do we look at you know this diversity and social geography and how do we look at from a, a social policy perspective and i think um, um, with these kind of discussions i think uh, uh, we make it a more meaningful engagement uh, as part of the seminar and lecture series and uh, despite the limitations of uh, you know uh, not getting to uh, meet all of you individually uh, in india but uh, i think we are doing the best that we can and we also thank our audience uh, for you know uh, taking time out to uh, attend this discussion and also to uh, which is what makes us uh, makes this seminar series uh, so uh, you know uh, energetic and carry on uh, uh, week after week with uh, such distinguished panels so i'm thankful to everybody who has joined in today and uh, once again thankful to these uh, wonderful distinguished speakers uh, and uh, uh, we, we, we will be uh, uploading an edited version of this video on the Ahmedabad University uh, YouTube channel also soon. And once again, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, attending this. Thank you.